hi everyone, my name is Caroline Moreau. I'm so sorry I can't be with you today. So I'm virtual. Um, I'm actually in Jamaica doing a training for the Global Early Adolescent Study, but I really wanted to be here because I'm thrilled to welcome Nadia Diamond Smith um, to our noon seminar today. Um, as you've probably guessed, um, Nadia is an alumni of this department. Actually, before she joined us, she has um, she completed a master's at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then she completed her PhD in L department and David was her advisor. Um, she has moved uh, to a successful academic career. And right now she's an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostats, and as well as an Institute for Global Health Science at UCSF. So Nadia's dissertation was about fertility and sex selection in India. And a lot of her work has uh, still focused on that part of the world, but she really now studies the intersection between women's empowerment and reproductive health. Uh, again, mostly in South Asia, um, and she's interested in how women's status in their homes and communities impact health across their life course. She's also interested in designing and evaluating interventions to see how we can improve women's health um, more broadly. Today, mm -hmm. she's going to be speaking about a really exciting study in Nepal, um, around the turnaway study. I think a lot of you might be familiar with a turnaway study in the United States. And, and this is an extension of this work in Nepal, but she's also gonna be talking about extended work among women's empowerment in Nepal. So Nadia, you're very much welcome. We, we hope to see you uh, in person in the very uh, future, near future, but um, delighted to have you um, um, join us virtually. Great, thank you so much for that warm welcome, Caroline. And it's lovely to be here and nice to see some familiar names, at least on the screen and um, excited to meet the rest of you. And also I just, before I jump into the talk, wanna say that if you know anyone is thinking about life post PhD or degree and wanted to talk about academia, I know there's a lot of, you know, fears sometimes about going that route, I'm always happy to talk to anybody. So feel free to reach out to me about career professional stuff, in addition to these other things. So with that, I think I'll share my screen. Okay, so as Caroline said, I'm gonna talk about two projects actually today. Um, one is the Nepal Turnaway Study, which I'll talk about second. And the first is work that is already completed. Um, that was part of the KO1 that I had through the um, through NICHD. So just taking a step back at sort of the framing that I use when thinking about a lot of the research and then design and interventions that I work on is thinking about sort of a woman's life in South Asia. Again, that's where most of my work is centered and various different um, social, cultural, personal, and then health-related experiences that she might have across her life course that could impact her health. So we can think about a woman moving through childhood, adolescence, maybe she gets often gets married in this setting, you know, moving through adulthood, most likely has a pregnancy or two or three, and then, you know, continues on through her life course with experiences outside of pregnancy. And we can think about a lot of factors, of course, that might influence and impact her health and her life experiences. So we can think about what happens in childhood related to care seeking, nutrition, um, other types of care or health related factors in childhood, going through adolescence, maybe access and use to family planning to delay, space, or limit her pregnancies, general things about nutrition or eating practices across all of her life course. And then of course, the quality of services she gets outside of pregnancy for pregnancy, delivery, postpartum and beyond. And all of these are impacted by her being a woman. You know, Even though these are experiences that women have, they are also impacted by gender inequality in society, gender norms and the related stress um, that she might experience because of these types this uh, these types of norms or discrimination that she faces or things like IPV. And then also, of course, there is a layer of environmental exposures, other structural factors, you know, household factors that all interplay to sort of um, 
to impact how she is experiencing her life and her health. And so this is sort of the framing that I use to think about what might be impacting maternal and child health outcomes in the settings that I'm working. So moving into the um, my KL1 project, which is in Nepal, both of the projects I'm talking about are in Nepal today, which is really focused on women's empowerment and health and narrowing in on newly married women. So South Asia, taking a step back, is home to about a quarter of the world's children, and yet 50% of the world's wasted children live in Asia and South Asia. And so, you know, we can think about why is there, you know, there's this extra burden of poor health among children in the South Asian setting. There's also higher rates of many adverse birth outcomes. South Asia also has the highest rates of child marriage in the world and some of the lowest indicators of women's status and empowerment globally. So how are these interrelated? You know, we know that early marriage leads to early childbearing, which is associated with poor maternal and child health outcomes. And then, of course, aside from just thinking about the health of children, we can also think that women being able to delay their first birth might give them more opportunities across their life course in terms of being able to remain in school or perhaps engage in labor force differently or just meeting their own reproductive or other life goals that might, you know, might include different, different desires for the timing of childbirth. And then we also know that women's low status throughout their life course might put them at low at risk of poor health outcomes, thinking back to that slide a slide ago, you know, if she has poor nutrition, lack of health services, you know, throughout childhood, adolescence, and into life, that's going to impact her own health and the health of her children. So when we think about who might be sort of the nexus of these two, of, you know, women's status and of health, child health, um, poor child health outcomes in Nepal, you know, I think one place where this really comes together is thinking about newly married women. And so here I'm zooming in on Nepal. So in Nepal, the average age of marriage is 18 and a half. 50% um, of women are pregnant within a year of marriage. And these are pretty similar statistics to India and other South Asian countries as well. We know that co-residence is common. So in marriage practices usually mean that women move into their husband's home at the time of marriage, living with their in-laws, this is especially true early in marriage, things are changing a little bit, but usually still in the first few years of, years of marriage, women are living with their husband's family and his parents, so her in-laws. And newly, these newly married women are really at the lowest status in their household, so they have little decision-making power, lack of access to health care, they're often the last to eat due to the cultural norms around eating, who serves the food, and then, you know, when there's leftover food, who gets it. And then this perceived pressure to bear children as soon as possible. So here's a multi-generational household, and we can see, you know, many women, different generations living together, um, including a young newly married woman. So the impetus for my research is really, you know, we know that women's status in their households and communities is low in South Asia, and this is associated with poor health outcomes, and that women in early marriage have especially low status. Yet, we know that most interventions wait to intervene until pregnancy, and this is problematic because in Nepal, as in many places in the world, um, there's people often don't seek care until three, four, or five months into pregnancy due to a variety of different factors. Um, you know, and so if we are waiting to intervene until pregnancy, this is often misses a large chunk of pregnancy. Also, we know that the preconception period is key to improving health, and this is really neglected globally in terms of thinking about improving women's experiences and um, the health of their babies. And of course, we should also think about improving women's health outside of the fact that they might just become pregnant. You know, if so much of our efforts as a global health community are focused on, oh, she's pregnant, let's intervene, we're really missing out on the fact that, you know, women have a right to have better access to health care and better health um, aside from just their pregnancy. So what I was really interested in is thinking about if the time of marriage is an opportune window to promote healthy patterns, right? These are new relationships. Women are moving into a new household. You know, arranged marriages are still the most common um, in the settings that I've been working in. You know, so it's a whole new set of relationships and dynamics. And rather than waiting a few years until these patterns have been set and, you know, women's status is kind of solidified in the household, like, is there a time, is this an opportunity to intervene early working with households to try to improve women's status, relationships, communication, and while to improve her health before she gets pregnant, aside from just her becoming pregnant, and then also, of course, when she may become pregnant and have children, and thinking about, you know, supporting her if she doesn't want to have that pregnancy, um, like 
right away in that first you know year or two of marriage. Um, and this, this have added benefits to women and children more broadly. So with that in mind, um, I wrote a uh, K01 application, which was funded by NSHD. So this was in a study, a district in Nepal, which is actually right on the Indian border. So it's very similar to India. Actually, like a quarter of participants were from India, married across the border. So very similar for those of you who might know India better to that sort of like northern Uttar Pradesh plains part of India. Um, not the mountainous, beautiful Himalayan part of Nepal, unfortunately, for my visits there. Um, and so the focus was on understanding the experience of newly married women and the intersection between their status and health, and then thinking about how we can support them. Just briefly, the study designs, we had a qualitative phase where we did triadic in-depth interviews with newly married women, the husbands and mother-in-laws, because again, I'm really interested in thinking about, you know, we know in the setting households are Decisions are often made at a household level. So, you know, and we so often focus just on women or maybe husbands, but, you know, we decision making is broader than that. And I think we need to be thinking more broadly about how to engage all people who are part of the household decision making process about many things, including health. And then we did a longitudinal study with 200 newly married women and followed them for two years, every six months for two years. Um, and newly married in this context was married within three to four months. Um, and then, we, you know, so we followed them for about, you know, till they were two years married. And then we developed and piloted an intervention. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the findings. Um, so one of the things that came out of our study was that women's desires were not being met. So in that first round, when we first recruited women about, you know, three to four months post-marriage, most desired two children, about 8.5% had already gotten pregnant. Most didn't want children right away. And 20, a third, almost a third said that it would be inconvenient to have a child right now. And yet, 18 months later, oh, the vast majority of them had gotten pregnant. And so we really saw that what we were hearing from women is they wanted to delay the first birth, and yet they weren't able to. Um, so the desire to delay the first birth was very high. So, you know, there's sort of one thing that we really came away with from the study was that there's sort of this perception, especially in the South Asian context, that, you know, we can't really do much to shift the timing of that first birth. The pressure is so high for women to have, like, prove their fertility and have a baby early in marriage that, you know, family planning programs really focus on spacing and um, limiting. When, you know, they're targeting people after the first birth or after two births. For those of you that might work in India, you know, sterilization is very high. A lot of women get have their two births and at 25 are sterilized. And, you know, so there's kind of, I think that's been the, the driving perspective behind family planning programs efforts in um, South Asia. And what we really found is like, maybe that's not true. Like maybe there is more of an opportunity to think about the people are wanting to delay that first birth. So here we have a husband saying, you know, I feel that we should become responsible at first before giving birth. I wanna wait until we get more mature. I've started to work and learning things. My wife is new you know, therefore we can wait one more year. So, you know, people weren't talking about waiting five years or 10 years, but they just wanted to wait a little bit, get to know each other. We heard this theme over and over again from the women and the husbands, like we want to get to know each other. We want to get a little, become a little bit more mature. And so this really was surprising. And I think goes against a lot of the prevailing expectations and assumptions about what can happen in that early married, um, early marriage period. And one of the things that also came up a lot was this idea that economic opportunities were a potential mechanism for delay. You know, women kept saying, you know, we mostly all go to school now and then we get married and we can't do anything. And like, maybe if I could work a little, you know, then I could like delay having the first birth a year or two. And husbands also sort of were like, oh, it could give her an opportunity to work. Um, and so this was something that was an interesting idea that we heard voiced from women throughout the study. Despite these, um, this desire, there was little communication about childbearing. So, you know, less than half of them had discussed how many children they wanted to have with their husband early in marriage. One woman said, well, who should I talk to? My husband is busy. He doesn't stay. You know, we don't talk about this matter. So really this idea of, you know, these are these new relationships and couples don't really know each other and don't have the time or haven't had the space to start having these conversations. And then with this idea of this pressure to bear children, we really found some very interesting mixed findings. So, you know, people were grappling with their own desires, their perceptions of the pressure from their families or the community. So here's a husband saying, actually, I want a child after a year. 
I have, but I'm going to be going abroad. My wife will be lonely. My parents want a child. And so thinking about this, I put my mind and want it early. And we really often, you know, all of the household members, we saw them voicing this kind of like their desire, but this perceived pressure or like, who is it coming from? And maybe we should just do it earlier. And what was really interesting was the mother-in-laws. Um, you know, so we could see this one mother-in-law saying, well, from one point of view, if she gives early, I can see my grandchildren, but if she gives late, her body will be mature and she will have strength. Um, you know, if she gives birth early, she might not have enough strength. It'll be difficult. But if then if she gives birth late, the people will talk about it, you know, this idea of like backbiting and the community perception. So again, you know, this is this, you see the husband thinking that parents want it, but then we saw the parents, often they themselves thought that maybe there could be a benefit of delay, but they saw the community pressure, right? So what we really took away from this is sort of where are these norms coming from? Like, you know, whose who's perception of where people's individual desires are kind of in conflict with what they see their community wanting, but wondering, is that actually what the perceptions are of their family members or community members? And how can we kind of address getting all of these um, different people talking to each other more and understanding more about, you know, where they might be more aligned than they think. Um, as one might expect, family planning use was fairly low. Um, about a quarter had used family planning. Most of the husbands knew. Most of them said it was a joint decision in the cases where that had happened. Um, though this was not always the case. So here's a one woman saying, I wish to give birth after a year and a half to two years. I'm young. What would I do giving birth so soon? But my husband insists he wants a child and hasn't used family planning um, and he's not willing to use methods. You know, so there were there were situations, of course, where there was differences of opinions and, um, you know, there was a lack of family planning use was the result of that. Another woman said, my husband doesn't know. I told him to buy it. He feels shy. He doesn't have modern thoughts. He likes to live a simple life. He hasn't studied much. So again, you know, we saw some desire, but some lack of awareness is also being an issue among this population. Um, just stepping a little bit away from fertility for a minute. Um, you know, the lives of these women were also hard in a lot of other ways. And, you know, we have some other papers that focus more on nutrition and mental health. So I want to give you a snapshot of those. So there was fairly high rates of, you know, depression or anxiety or just like poor mental health um, among the newly married women. And this did increase over time throughout those first two years of marriage, unfortunately. Um, women reported, one thing I was really interested in is how things change from their parents' house to their in-laws' house when that first round of data when they had just moved. And the vast majority reported eating less um, in their new house compared to their parents' house. Um, and about half of them reported always use, are usually eating last in their household. Um, and this actually didn't change much throughout the course of the study. And we found that, you know, some of these very gendered roles that women play were associated with poor mental health. I think sometimes when I talk about some of these things like, you know, this cultural practice of women eating last, people are like, oh, well, that's a cultural practice. Women are happy to do that because that's how we do things. But what we found is actually like, this made women feel bad. You know, they were internalizing sort of the role they see themselves playing, and this was associated with poor mental health. Um, and we also found that marital relationship quality was associated with um, mental health outcomes. And this is again, you know, using the longitudinal data, so we're look, able to not just look at like cross sections of these associations, but how they were associated with each other over time. So one of the things I was really interested in was, okay, so we know newly married women have this low status in their household. Like, how does this change? Does this change? What makes it change? And of course, one of the things that people often say is like, oh, well, giving a birth, right? When she gives birth, this is going to improve her status in the household. So we had this interesting opportunity to be able to look at that. So we looked at what one outcome that could be a measure of her status would be intimate partner violence. There was fairly high rates of um, intimate partner violence, which increased over time from about 25% to almost 60%. And against our hypothesis, we found that actually pregnancy increased women's odd of, ex of experiencing IPV. We thought it would decrease, be protective, um, but it increased her odds. Unfortunately, the sample was too small to look at the differences by sex of the baby. For those of you who might work in South Asia, some preference is fairly common there. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a possibility that this is related to the sex of the baby, but um, we weren't powered to look at that. So then we another marker of her status could be her access to food or nutrition, sort of some of these things about like, does she eat last or is she given like high quality nutritious foods? And we found that becoming pregnant or working outside the home, so these were again markers of status, um, increased dietary diversity, but only for women who were in food secure households, and this didn't continue postpartum. 
Um, so, you know, like there seemed to be like a little improvement when she was pregnant, but then it didn't, her status didn't stay high related to access to food nutrition. So this is probably a marker more of programs have done a good job of being like, make sure to give your pregnant wife, you know, more nutritious foods, but it's kind of, it doesn't lead to a sustained impact on her status in the longer term. Um, so, you know, it's more complicated than we thought, you know, this idea that giving birth is going to improve women's standing in her household didn't really seem to hold in the way that we were expecting. So based on this, we, um, with our community partners through a very long community engaged process, designed an intervention, um, which was for groups of newly married women, their husbands and mother-in-laws coming together with other groups of newly married women, their husbands and mother-in-laws from the same community. So, um, you can see this little picture I tried to draw to get a sense of the fact that it's like the, the household triads, but then with others in their group. We piloted this, it's a four-month intervention. We piloted it with just 30 households. Um, these are a list of sort of the topics that we covered that, again, came out of our formative work and talking with our community partners. Um, and there was, it was very, very interactive. So there was a lot of these games, you know, where we had people, um, you know, like, have a box of oranges and you know distribute them among different people in the room, assuming they're different household members, and then like take away some of the oranges and talk about now how would you distribute it to the husband, the pregnant woman, the child, et cetera, you know, to really get them to think about like how is their gender and their behaviors, you know, how are those really playing out in different scenarios? We did things like having the mother-in-laws talk about what their experience was like being a newly married woman and kind of, you know, discussions around their own, you know, those gender roles that they experienced and um, some of the discrimination they experienced in having that conversation. So there was a lot of really interactive activities. Um, and the goal was really to provide basic information, but really to build relationships and then also to address not just individual and household, but also community level norms. Again, getting at this idea that we really saw there was a disconnect often between even people with the same house within the same household in terms of what they were um, wanting and what they thought others wanted of them. So we found that it had, you know, again, this was a really small sample, just pre-post knowledge, um, but we found that it had like a increased, significant increase in um, knowledge over time about most family planning, you know, um, pregnancy related outcomes, a lot of really positive, um, really positive responses when we did the qualitative interviews with participants, you know, Earlier, husband and wife, we never used to talk openly, but it's changed. We talk openly. Love and care has increased between us. You know, and my mother-in-law says the same. Uh, there was, women did report an increased intention to use family planning over time. Um, I mean, so again, you know, we don't have enough for really behavior outcomes. Some more quotes. You know, people should use contraception. I don't think anyone should be forced anybody to give birth. It's the completely the husband and wife's decision. We see another mother-in-law saying, I wish my daughter-in-law to study more. There's still time to bear a child. They're young. They can do it later. Here's another um, woman saying that the mother-in-law had an old way of thinking. She would tell me to have a baby right away, but now she's you know, had this change of perspective and I'm really happy to see her. Um, and she even helps in the household work and talks to me nicely. So we really saw you know, changing sort of perceptions and norms, but also really it seemed like people experienced a change in their household dynamics, which was really exciting. A couple more quotes um, about, you know, again, changes in their household relationships. I feel like people love me more and it's reciprocated um, regarding number of children. You know, people should do as they wish rather than listening to waiting for what other people say. And then again, a little bit, we had a session on sex preference. So there was sort of, some people did talk a little bit about, you know, my mom felt this pressure to keep having children until she had a son, but today's daughters don't have to do that and just, uh, wait till have a son. And um, just a couple more norms. We did see a change in how people were um, disagreeing with statements about like whether it was wrong to use family planning at all, or especially before the first birth. Again, you can see here, this is like not entirely significant. Um, so I think again, this like norm around <laughs> delaying the first birth is tough. You know, people talked about it, but really it was, that was, it's a, it's a tough one to really completely shift. Um, but again, I think this was very positive um, direction of our findings. So just to summarize, Many newly married women are not having, and their partners are not having their desires met. Women do have low status in early marriage, but it doesn't seem like this idea that by giving birth is going to really change her situation was like a clear pathway out of it. 
And I think that one of the big takeaways is this prevailing assumption that desire, that there's the strong desire for early childbearing. This might not hold up. The world is changing. Women's roles are changing. Opportunities are changing. And I think that we as a community trying to support people, especially in things in terms of thinking about family planning, that there's um, an opportunity for more focus in the pre-pregnancy period, the early marriage period. And this is even true for husbands and mother-in-laws. And also just the you know, part of what with the intervention I really want to see is will these newly married women and their husbands and mother-in-laws show up at a group with other people in their community to talk about these sensitive things? Like I wasn't even sure if that would really be possible. And people really seem to like it. It was like reading the quotes are just like incredible. Um, and so it seems like this type of an intervention is what's feasible and acceptable in these communities and did seem to lead to some changes. And just to plug, I'm trying to get funding to um, test the effectiveness of this, you know, in a larger sample. Um, the focus of that outcome will be uh, anemia, but also a spinoff from this one, you know, based on this finding about women saying that they really wanted more opportunities to engage some more life skills opportunities and perhaps like some hard skills opportunities that they could, um, that that might be a pathway for them to be able to negotiate to delay the first birth a little. Um, I did just get an R01, which we're starting in Udaipur, India, where we're going to be testing the impact of a life skills and reproductive health empowerment intervention just for newly married women um, on their ability to avoid an unattended pregnancy. So if anyone's interested in hearing more about that or participating in that, that's going to be going on for the next five years or so. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to shift to the turn away study. I don't know if I can stop for a minute or maybe I'll just keep going and we can have questions at the end. So still in Nepal, um, but now shifting to talk about the Nepal turn away study. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm not the PI in this project. I'm just a co-investigator. So the uh, PI is Diana Green Foster, who led the U.S. turn away study. But I helped write the grant and have been part of it the whole time. And we're actually applying for a uh, renewal to continue following some of these um, people. I can talk more about that at the end, but it's really exciting work. So thinking about abortion in Nepal. So the Nepal government has taken steps to provide comprehensive pregnancy options as part of women's health. So abortion was legalized in Nepal in 2002, um, but we know that many women still aren't able to get access to legal services, especially, you know, due to you know, Nepal has got has a lot of geographic challenges. It's very spread out. Most of the population lives in Kathmandu, but other parts of the population are, you know, in mountainous areas. Um, and also there's, you know, other barriers due to poverty. Um, just in terms of legal status. So it's legal up to 12 weeks for any reason and then up to 28 weeks for rape or incest. And so there's over 300,000 estimated abortions performed in Nepal, more, more than half of them in unapproved facilities or by unapproved providers. There is access to medication abortion since 2009. So um, we know that the severity of complications from unsafe abortions has declined um, and, and but the, the uh, number of unsafe terminations has not declined over time in Nepal. So again, this issue where you saw that a pretty high number of um, abortions outside of facilities. Sorry, get, get this working. It's still the third leading cause of maternal mortality. Um, you know, women as in Nepal, as in many other places who carry unwanted pregnancies to term face health risks. The WHO estimates that the risk of maternal death in Nepal is one in 150 compared to you know, much higher rate in the U.S., and we know that the U.S. isn't even that great compared to other settings. Um, in from data from the U.S. turnaway study and other work in Nepal mm -hmm. shows that the risk of death associated with childbirth is 14 times higher for abortion, but we don't really know what this is in um, the relative risk of childbirth versus abortion in Nepal. So this was really one of the driving factors, driving questions behind this study. So there was some preliminary qualitative work that Diana and others at ANSWER um, did, which I wasn't part of in Nepal, Bangladesh, Colombia, Tunisia, and South Africa, to look at sort of women's experiences. When they were thinking about doing the, replicating the turnaway study in another setting, they kind of did this like formative work to see where might be a good place and understand a little bit about the landscape. So women were frequently denied abortions, even where care was legal. As we already knew from the quantitative data, women denied abortions go outside the legal system. 
but a large proportion of women who were denied went on to be able to get an abortion anyway somewhere else. And there was a high level of morbidity and mortality from some illegal abortions, but again, some were extremely safe. Um, and that qualitative work suggested that pregnant, carrying a pregnancy to term also has significant health risks for women denied illegal abortion. So again, it's this balance of like childbirth, abortion, you know, and how does that play out in different settings? So based on all of this, the study objectives of the Nepal Turnaway Study were to investigate the predictors of denial of abortion, to examine the consequences of unwanted pregnancy for women's health, but also socioeconomic status, and to measure the consequences of an unwanted pregnancy on the health and well-being of a woman's existing children and subsequent children, you know, by following women over time um, post their abortion seeking, um, we really are able to, many of them went on to have other children. This was true in the U.S. Turnaway study, and this, we, this was true in our study too. And so we can look at, you know, if women are able to have a pregnancy at a time that they want, are they able to, you know, invest more in it or that child or, you know, whatever else might be their hopes for having a child at a later time um, compared to the women who aren't able to do that. So maybe I'll just take a moment. I assume most people know about the turn, the U.S. Turnaway Study, but I, I realized just in case not. So I think that, you know, so the idea of both of these studies is to recruit a group of women right at the time of abortion seeking. And, you know, we know that and I think in the U.S. Turnaway study, it was a very narrow window. They were recruited women who were just like a week below and a week above, I think, the, the gestational age cutoff. So with the idea being that, you know, we can't randomize abortion, but we know these women should be pretty similar. They're both coming pretty late in their pregnancies. And, you know, it's just a matter of days that kind of puts them at this like line between being able to get their abortion and being denied an abortion is a little bit more complicated in Nepal. So unfortunately, we weren't able to do quite like a clean cut study in terms of that like narrow gestational age. I'll talk a little bit about there was like a couple different phases of how we like it, in, what our eligibility criteria was, but it's basically the same idea. Recruit women as they're seeking an abortion right before they come in, they go in to see a provider. So they don't know yet if they're going to be able to be, if they're going to be denied or if they're going to have their abortion and then follow them for three years. Um, this is a map of where, you know, we collected data from a number of sites all across Nepal. And we collected data at that time of recruitment. We followed up with them six weeks later, and then we did interviews every six months for three years. And so actually data collection is still going on for the Nepal Turnaway Study. So all of the things I'm presenting are preliminary. We collect a huge host of different outcomes, um, and you know, economic, social, child health, mental health, anthropometry. So some of our findings, we we do we have recruited everybody, so we know a lot about that initial visit and you know who seeks abortion after ten weeks, who's denied care, and then what happens to the women after being denied. So, in terms of who seeks abortions earlier versus later, as we might expect, participants who are younger, not married, less educated, less wealthy, or from one of the lower castes in Nepal, were more likely to present after ten weeks. Other risk factors were ge geographic, um, you know, finding out they were pregnant late, being unaware about the legality of abortion, or if people who, a large number of the women in our study had tried to get abortion somewhere else first. And then the extent of denial. So we, we had this initial recruitment period where we were recruiting anyone seeking abortion because we weren't really sure what was going to happen since this was, you know, a little bit of a less familiar context, even to our partners who work a lot on abortion um, in Nepal. So what we found was that one in 10 women seeking abortions were turned away and a third um, of those ones who were turned away carried the pregnancy to term. Then after, I think it was like a three month period where we had that wide range, we like narrowed it to be more similar to the US turn away. So that was, we only looked at women who are seeking abortions after 10 weeks. So a higher proportion were denied abortions, but a very similar proportion of those denied carried the pregnancy to term. So among those who we have data from the six week follow-up, 56% um, had an abortion at the facility. And uh, 51 that day and 5% after being initially denied. And those were people who they were told to like, you know, the doctor's not here, but come tomorrow and, you know, or like bring your husband and come tomorrow or something like that. Um, so, you know, we had a little bit of a discussion of like, is that denial? Is that not denial? You know, there's, a, there's it was a lot 
there was a lot more gray space in this study than in the U.S. turnaway, which has made us had to think think a lot. Um, Forty four percent were denied an abortion at the facility, and those um, you know fourteen percent of those were under ten weeks, and fifty six percent over ten weeks. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to move around my video so I can. So, um, who? Let's see. Oh, sorry. Um, so we know that. So who's denied abortion care? We know that those who are post pregnancies are beyond ten weeks. Again, similar to what we saw before: younger women, not married, women with no children. So maybe that little bias on the part of the provider about like who should or shouldn't be able to have an abortion. Um, you know, women who don't work outside the home, women whose only reason for abortion is sex selection, again, legal status and um, less wealthy. We didn't find any difference. We did have private and government facilities. We didn't find any difference in denial between those, interestingly. When we look at who received and were denied their abortions by eligibility status, um, we saw that uh, more, you know, 22% of people who were denied their abortion was, were not legally eligible for abortion, whereas that was only 3% among the people who received their abortion. And, um, you know, more of the people who received their abortion were legally eligible for it. In terms of abortion attempts after denial of care, so among the women who were not served at the recruitment facility and completed a six week interview, most of them attempted to end their pregnancy elsewhere. Um, and most of those were successful. So I, this is also something that was different from the U.S. turnaway study. I think there there was fewer women who were able to go on and get a an abortion after they were denied, and part of that is due to the fact that it had this much stricter recruitment window period, uh, or like uh, eligibility um, criteria, and so this is great um, for the women who are seeking abortion. For our study design, a little bit more complicated because since most, since so many of those that were initially denied ended up being able to get their abortion, we ended up with fewer women who gave birth. Um, I think we're still going to be powered to do the analyses we're hoping for, but compared to the U.S. turnaway, uh, there's like fewer of the abortion seekers ended up with actual births in the long run. Um, complications were similar after abortion um, at the recruitment site and for those who went to get it elsewhere. And then 37% either delivered, had a miscarriage, or were still pregnant when we last interviewed them. So who's more likely to give birth after denial of an abortion? Similar, younger women, um, women, or well, I guess this is the opposite, women who are married, women with lower levels of education, don't work outside the home, lower caste, and lower wealth quintile. So some of the impacts, so preliminary evidence, um, we have some preliminary evidence of worth physical health for women who give birth compared to those who receive an abortion. We didn't see an impact. You know, I think one of the things we were thinking when we designed this is maternal mortality is so much higher in Nepal. You know, we were really expecting to have a much clearer sort of evidence that like carrying a pregnancy to term was like a greater risk than having an abortion. And we didn't end up seeing that. Um, but you know, there, and we're trying, sort of trying to think through with our partners about, you know, why that might be, if there are some bias in the women who we ended up recruiting or their access to healthcare or other things. But in terms of physical health more broadly, we, you know, we have some questions about like their perception of physical health. Um, also, in addition to markers of physical health, but there's some evidence of worse physical health for women who give birth compared to those who receive an abortion. Um, surprisingly, we didn't see a large difference in complications for the uh, women who received an abortion. Um, and this is about the recruitment site compared to those who got an abortion after being turned away. You know, we're still also trying to, you know, it's harder to compare the complications of a birth versus in a <laughs> we're, we're thinking about that a little bit more. In terms of economic um, impacts, we see some preliminary evidence that women unable to get an abortion have worse economic outcomes in the long run, such as lower food insecurity, food security, they have a greater chance of being underweight. Um, you know, we asked some really interesting questions about their own goals and aspirations for the coming years that related to <laughs> factors. And so we see that they are lower chance, you know, so these were things like, oh, I still want to be in school two years from now, or, you know, things like that. And so we're looking at what they said and then what they achieved. So they were a lower chance of setting and achieving their, their aspirations. 
We also see some evidence of impacts on relationships. So there seems to be a lower chance of living with their husband. We also have some measures of like couples relationship quality, which um, it does seem that there's some difference in relationship quality. Um, I've been looking a little bit at some of the empowerment outcomes since that's my area of interest. And so we see that women have a lower chance of being in school um, and lower decision-making power in the household over time. So women who give birth are less likely to be able to continue being in school and um, have less decision-making power in their household. We're, um, I've also been looking a little bit into some of the things related to son preference. So there was a subset of women seeking abortions specifically because they said that they were doing so because they wanted a child of a different sex. Um, this was one of the options that we gave them um, the survey. And um, want stating that they wanted a child of a different sex was associated with denial. Sex selective abortion is not legal. So that would be a reason that a provider could say that they would deny an abortion to somebody. Um, but of course, like saying they want a child of a different sex, it was, it was associated with later gestational age, but you have to have be at a certain gestational age in order to be able to determine the sex of the baby. So it's a little bit circular in terms of trying to understand like how gestational age fits into the um, picture. Cause like, because denial was also associated with lower gestational age. So they're a little bit confounded there. And I've been looking a little bit about sort of this question of like among those who said they wanted a, that they were getting and seeking an abortion because they wanted a child of a different sex among those that were denied. So they gave birth, you know, what happens to them in terms of their next pregnancy, right? We might think that they might then be more pressured to more quickly go on to have a, another pregnancy to meet whatever their desire is for the sex of that baby. And so I've been trying to look at the time to subsequent birth among that subset of people who did give birth or denied their abortion. So had a baby that was not that, you know, not at the time that they wanted. And they said that it was because of sex selective reasons. Um, and so we do see that those that wanted a baby of a different sex and were denied their abortion are more likely to get pregnant more quickly. So, you know, this of course has implications for both the health of the mom, the health of the baby that was just born, the health of the next baby. And so um, some things to think about there. Um, so we haven't gotten to look into the child health data yet, but next steps are to really look at the economic and developmental well-being of the existing children, because most of these women already had babies. And then also of the children born because of abortion denial compared to the next child that the woman's born, that women who did get their abortion have, which presumably could, we assume is at a time that she wanted. Um, and so <clears throat> in those two groups. Um, so really the question is, does control over circumstances of the birth affect child well-being? I'm gonna have another couple of minutes to talk about the in-depth interviews. Oh, we have a few in quotes, they're very rich and we're just starting to look through them. You know, so we, some women have told very poignant stories about their experiences, seeking abortions, being denied abortions, receiving their abortions. So here's one woman saying that, you know, she, I felt like I did like dying after I found out I was pregnant. People will scold me. I already have three children. It'd be difficult. Um, you know, when I told my husband, he responded that there's no harm in having a baby and went outside to drink alcohol. Uh, and then, you know, she got advice from neighbors and friends and did end up um, receiving her abortion. So we can just see the experiences of women, the stress and the anxiety and fears about having a pregnancy that they felt like they couldn't take care of. Um, and then here's a quote about, you know, sort of what the impact is of on household dynamics. So here's someone of having a birth that they couldn't take care of or that there was mistimed or unwanted. So after the birth of my daughter, I've been suffering. I get tired easily. I've been weak. My father passed and people brought fruits to our house. Everyone used to have it, but no one would give me. I was craving apples. I asked my husband's sister and she said, she can't do anything for me. If my husband's not giving me fruits, no one took care of me. And, you know, so you can really see that women are really struggling in this time period and, you know, not um, being often getting the care that they are hoping for from their families. And here's another quote from a woman who was denied. Like, um, I did go for my checkups. I was vaccinated, but I didn't feel like taking care. My husband brought me food, but I didn't bother taking care of my health. I used to stay angry thinking about why am I giving birth to this baby? I wished I could have a miscarriage sometimes. I used to have such thoughts till I was seven to eight months pregnant um, and I didn't want to give birth to my baby till the last moment. So again, it's really, you know, carrying babies to term for the women who did try to seek abortions was really, you know, a 
a heartbreaking and painful uh, experience. So just in summary, abortion denial was common. Many women were able to get their abortions elsewhere, however. So I think that, you know, again, part of this has to do with our study design, but I think that this is, you know, a, it's, you know, it's really good news in some, um, you know, that even if that there are other services available and that for them, you know, a large majority of the women, even those who were denied, were able to get their abortions. You know, we, we see evidence that having an unwanted or mistimed birth was associated with adverse longer term empowerment relationship, economic and health related outcomes. And, you know, we'll know more about what happens to the children, um, hopefully in soon. So I just wanted to thank so my colleague Mahesh Curry and Krepa, they are our partners for both of the two studies I talked about. Both of the studies were also funded by NICHD. So thanks to that. And then um, just to acknowledge some of the support I've had on my K01. Thank great. you, Nadia. This was great. Super. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting work. Very depressing work. I mean, I, I loved hearing hearing your presentation, but it, at the end of it, I'm so depressed. So um, I'm going to open it up for, for questions. And usually we start with students. And I'm also advising those who are online to use the chat um, and post your questions. And I can't see people in the room. So students, if you have questions, just um, go for it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have two questions about the intervention for newly married women in Nepal. So my first question is, um, you mentioned a lot of successful impacts on those community members and families, but did you also encounter any conflicts or like oppositions from community members, participants, and how did you overcome those? My second question is about, did the intervention impact the, um, the households without husbands the same way as they did for other in a household, because I imagine a lot of husbands are away or were planning to be away to migrate you know, to, to India or other parts of Nepal. And there's like uncertainty about when, like, are we going to be able to, you know, plan for the next child? There's a lot of pressure in the you know, absence of husband. There's also increasing pressure from like other family members. So I'm wondering if they were able, you were able to make the same positive impacts on those households. Great questions. Um... So in terms of the question about opposition, you know, I was very fortunate. Um, yeah, so the, my partners in Nepal, um, who are a research organization, CREPA, um, they, so I've been working with them for a number of years, even before these projects. And one of the things I've really worked for in my career is to try to have partners who are like true partners and thought partners and we think design the studies together and really think about based on you know our shared interests and understanding and knowledge and also their sort of philosophy and outlook and so you know throughout the process ever start, starting as soon as we got it when we were even just doing the initial qualitative interviews you know Mahesh and his team were doing like regular stakeholder meetings and community sort of sensitization to our projects and engagement and he made sure that I came all the time. And we went to the communities and I participated in those meetings, even though I was pregnant twice when I did that, <laughs> you need to come or you have your baby. <laughs> and, um, and so I think that as part of that process, the communities that we were working in really felt like they had been engaged for years by the time we even came to the intervention. And that was, those were the like sort of the leaders in the community. And then of course we've been working with, you know, households like, you know, down, um, you know, down through in who are actually like, you know, the community members that we were trying to work with were part of the design process. And there was also a local NGO who had also decades of experience working in these communities who was part of the design and then also was the, were the moderators and sort of leading the intervention itself. So I think because of those reasons, you know, we had a lot of support from the community. You know, that's hard work to do, but I think that's what we all should be doing, especially with these types of interventions that are addressing challenging things like norms and, you know, sort of like trying to engage a variety of household members and, you know, kind of really extend into a lot of avenues of people's lives. Um, I, you know, I think that 
people do, you know, community-based participatory research and try to engage families, but, and it's a lot of work. It's, you know, to show up and really do that. But I think that that's what we all should be doing and is essential for things to be successful. I mean, we'll see what it's like if I am able to get funding to um, expand this into more communities to do an actual RCT at a larger scale, you know, that's going to be different. And I think, you know, we probably will see more, might face more challenges. In terms of the husbands, yeah, this part of Nepal has a lot of male out migration. <laughs> um, and so there, I think that like we recruited more households and, you know, then one husband left then, and they leave really soon. It's like, they don't know they're going to leave. I think they have their paperwork in and then it can happen any minute that like all of a sudden they're going to migrate a very, a lot of migration to the Gulf states. And um, so that was a challenge. Um, you know, we had the eligibility criteria be that the husbands all had to be there. And we managed to have husbands who were there for all four months of the intervention. Um, but I do think that that's something that partners have brought up and that I think could be a challenge in the future, especially working in this part of Nepal where there is high male out migration. Also just like men's work was hard. There was a lot of like shuffling around of like the timings that the meetings could be among the groups. Cause you know, it's hard for that since, you know, men more often had less flexibility in their jobs in terms of coming to something like this. So it's a, it's a real challenge, right? We want to engage people and, but there's the practical practicalities of what their lives are like and doing something that doesn't add burden and that they want to do and works for their schedules. So um, it's definitely tough. Thank you. Um, Nadia, I'm seeing a hand up uh, from Rashita. Um, so maybe you can, um, you can ask your question and then I'm seeing a, a question in the chat from David after that. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed uh, throughout the presentation. So I'm from India and I can uh, relate to the study findings uh, in Nepal. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So in the first study, uh, did you categorize the participants based on educational status and uh, the uh, whether they are working or not. And uh, so one of the findings was that uh, almost 75% of the participants uh, became pregnant within uh, the first 18 months of marriage. So did, uh, did that differ between uh, women uh, who are working and women staying at home? And I have another question. Uh, so um, are you going to um, uh, conduct study among healthcare providers regarding uh, denying denial of the abortion services? Because uh, uh, during my medical training in India, I have seen my professors denying abortion services to even married women because uh, they feel that it is kind of unethical to conduct an abortion and end the uh, life of fetus. So uh, uh, I agree that there is, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, judgment about abortion uh, uh, among people uh, who are married and who are unmarried and the, um, you know, marriage is considered as, uh, you know, an acceptable uh, uh, pregnancy after marriage is more acceptable than pregnancy before um, uh, marriage. So are you planning to do the study among the healthcare providers? That is my second question. Thank you. Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, I'll, sh I'll just answer this one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point, you know, and we're still trying to unpack a little bit of this, who was like, who was denied and why they were denied and what the reasons. And, you know, unfortunately we did just collect data from women. So sometimes it's a little bit unclear as to like, was there a medical reason or did the provider just say you're not eligible? You know, it's like a little bit hard to tell. And I think collecting data from providers would be a great way. I, I know that Mahesh and his team, I think they've done a little bit of, they've done a lot of training of providers, um, of abortion providers as part of some of their other work. And 
um, we haven't talked about like trying to dig more into some of the denial reasons from the provider perspective, but I think that's a great, great point and something that probably deserves a lot more research because, right, a lot of women were denied and then went on to get them, right? So that really suggests that there's something about just like who they met that day at the clinic in some cases, right, that might be like a predictor, which kind of gets at some of the things you're talking about. Um, in terms of the first Nepal study, you know, one of the um, downsides, yeah, so I don't know how much all you guys know about KO1s. <laughs> you, there's only a limited amount of research funding and things you can, you know, what you can do with those resources over since it's mostly a training grant. And so, you know, we were working in just a couple of communities. And so there's not a lot of heterogeneity in among the women in terms of, um, you know, there's like some, one was like a slightly more peri-urban, semi-urban, and one was like really rural, but there didn't end up being a ton of, you know, and they were, we also had like a pretty narrow age recruitment and marriage recruit, you know, so it was like a pretty, eligibility criteria was pretty stringent. So there didn't end up being a ton of, you know, difference in terms of like their educational status um, and their work. I mean, we do see differences in, um, we do see differences in, I think I showed one slide that talked about um, how we've looked at like whether women who were work working outside the home, you know, had different status in terms of access to food and nutrition. So like there, you know, there was a little bit of difference over time. I, you know, I haven't actually looked closely at how like education and work were associated with, but again, it hasn't been the right data set to do a ton of exploration in terms of some of these like socioeconomic factors, just since it's pretty homogeneous. Thank you. Um, Nadia, I think um, David's question is getting on kind of a, uh, other issues related to selection of, of your your population in the turnaway. So the question is, are there are there potential exogenous instruments to predict being turned away? And if so, how strong are the instruments in the first stage model? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's something we haven't ta thought a ton about. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, I think one thing, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we tried to, I mean, I was thinking of something like whether the husband was with her or not, but that's probably sort of like related to like when she shows up and where she shows up and who she sees. But that did seem to be like a common reason for denial that maybe women might just be a little bit more random, like, oh, he could come that day or not come, like the mother-in-law came or the husband came and among maybe those who were married. Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. If you have any thoughts, David or anyone else, it would be open to. It's a good. It's a good question because it. Yeah. So David is saying distance, season, or rainfall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I don't know if that would impact whether they were denied. That what you're thinking, David? Yeah, yeah, Nadia. I think the provider's discretion might be affected by the uh, the day of the week um, or season. Uh, things that are not related to obviously to uh, outcomes that you care about in a direct way. I mean, I do think there was definitely something about there was definitely a number of women who were told like, "Come back tomorrow." but most of them seem to come back, right? So I think that there was something about like day of the week, like the doctor's just not there on Mondays that did seem to happen, but it did. It, it also seemed like most of those women then did come back the next day and get their abortion. So we ended up, we ended up not, for most of our analyses, we're not looking at like where they actually denied at that day, which is what they did in the US turnaway study. We have like a little bit of a broader definition to give some wiggle room because there was a lot more sort of like flux that seemed, but yeah, I mean, I don't know about, I mean, we did have COVID in all of this. So, you know, that's also something that we, we managed, we took a little pause and then we're able to resume for the most part, but you know, that's, uh, I, I don't think that we see a, too big of a difference in terms of like denial rates uh, in different phases of you know, and of course, South Asia had a very different looking 
COVID, you know, that first year was like pretty okay. And then it was really like spring, uh, spring of 2021 when things were bad. So, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk more. Okay. Great. <laughs> Still advising me even 10 years later, as I would hope. <laughs> um, let's open it up back to the room. If there are any questions in the room. I'm not hearing any, so I'm going to jump in and ask a question. I'm going back to the intervention. It, it seems like it was very much community participation, a lot of a lot of previous connections to that community. How do you how do you see this scaling up at all? Yeah, I mean, we will see. Um, but I think. I mean, I imagine, I think, you know, what we have, what Mahesh and I have talked about is that, you know, we would use a modified approach um, in terms of, you know, engaging, you know, working with like doing a lot of sort of sensitization and community onboarding, maybe not as much with the intervention design component as we did with this phase, but with the like, you know, before we start trying to, you know, implement our intervention in these communities. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll see, I think, um, what ends up happening. You know, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot for a couple of different projects I have that are where we are working with things that maybe are more, you know, might differ between different communities, especially when thinking about things like cultural practices or norms or things like that. And then we, want to have test something right at a, at a larger scale so we can really look at the effectiveness of it and you know if you end up adjusting things in one setting versus another like what does that mean you know how standardized does an intervention like this have to be in order for us to be able to like glean meaning and um, you know and think about rolling something up at larger scale and I, I think that that's I think a lot of people who probably you know, these are fundamentally sort of behavior change interventions and you know, it's hard for things to be like exactly standardized. We have a very set, you know, manual for the, but, you know, things change and conversations are different and maybe that's part of the goal of it. So if things, you know, if we learn in one community that a certain topic or a certain thing isn't appropriate to be discussing, like, I think we might adjust our intervention accordingly. But then of course that other raises other concerns when you, it's always this balance, right? Between, the rigorous science, what we read in our textbooks, and then, you know, what's ethical and what's practical and what's feasible on the ground. Totally agree. And I think, you know, part of um, your work is also to have information on implementation, which I think would be really valuable. And I see a last question because we're almost at time from Dana. Um, She's asking, what's the control group uh, if you were doing an RCT and really commenting about a couple interventions can be tough to evaluate. So, so who are your controls? Yeah, I mean, so what we've written in our R01, <laughs> which sadly I think it only scored 18th percentile, so not gonna be funded this time, but next time maybe, um, is that, you know, we thought we didn't have a control group. You know, I think some people, you have an attention control for a group type of things like this, but we thought that the group itself is part of what the intervention is, right? So our control group is people just receiving what the standard of care, which officially on the books in Nepal, and I think in India as well, is that the community healthcare workers are supposed to reach out to newly married couples about things like family planning and other stuff. Um, my, in all the communities of people I've talked to in both Nepal and India, I have gotten the message that that usually doesn't happen, but maybe that happens in some communities. Um, and so, and then we've offered that we've said that we'll like offer the intervention to those groups, to those communities post, you know, post the study. So they won't be newly married couples. You know, we think that that might not have the same value, but, you know, of course felt like that was the ethical thing. And I think still will have probably positive, you know, positive impacts on hopefully their relationship dynamics and um, health behaviors and outcomes in the longer term regardless. 
but yeah, I mean, if anyone works on these type of couples interventions, like love um, and has any ideas, excited always to get thoughts and feedback. Thank you, Nadia. And I don't think Stan is on the, on the call today, but he's always <laughs> someone to reach when we talk about couples. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. Round of applause for Nadia. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, keep us um, keep in touch. We really want to hear more about what your findings are. And it was lovely to see you. Thank you so much. And and have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. It was great to see you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.